Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Solidity Fridays. This is a bit of a different episode. Um, it's just going to be me, and I'll be giving a very brief introduction to zero knowledge cryptography. Um, I just gave this workshop, well, a version of this workshop at East Safari in Kenya, uh, which was a lovely experience, very grateful for it. Um, but I've changed it to make it a bit shorter, um, so we, we don't do as much as the advanced stuff at the end. Um, this is for anyone who doesn't even know much about cryptography, it's, it's for everyone. Um, but if you know a bit about zero knowledge, um, it might be a bit too basic of an introduction for you. Um, yeah, let's dig in. So what we'll be covering today is um, uh, cryptography basics, an introduction to zero knowledge and its applications. Then we will look at zero knowledge proofs, their properties, the types of zero knowledge proofs and the maths that's behind them. Then we'll look at privacy, uh, how to get private transactions on public blockchains. We'll look at zero knowledge scalability through rollups and ZK EVMs. We'll look at SNARKs, which is a type of zero knowledge proof called the succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. And then we'll look at stocks, which is a scalable, transparent argument of knowledge. And these are two very popular types of zero knowledge proofs. Um, so I'm quite excited to talk about those. Cool. So yeah, uh, cryptography is the study of secure communication in the presence of adversarial behavior. It enables all privacy in the digital world, world through emails, bank records, browsing history. Those are some of the applications of cryptography in the digital world. Um, so it, cryptography used to focus on message confidentiality through encryption. Um, so a message would be converted from a readable form into an incomprehensible form. And um, then at the other end, once it's got, gotten to the intended recipient, then it goes back to a readable um, form. And this uh, makes it readable for the two parties that are intended to read the message, but unreadable by anyone who uh, gets it in the, if someone like steals it in between. Um, as a transposition cipher, which uh, you rearrange the order of letters in a message. So hello world becomes hello world or something like that. Um, and that's just a simple rearrangement scheme. You also get substitution ciphers, which systematically replace letters or groups of letters with other letters um, and groups of letters. So you, um, sh uh, instead of saying A, every time there's an A, I will say the letter Z or something like that. Well, that's a bit of an obvious one. And you can do this in any alphabet. Um, yeah, so is, uh, cryptography has been around since the 1900, 1900 BC, so a very long time. Um, and it's been developing since, um, and now it's developed to a point where we have encryption standards, hashing and public key cryptography, and obviously zero knowledge proofs. So there are a few basic uh, cryptography uh, concepts, uh, cryptographic concepts that you need to know before we dig into zero knowledge. Um, so the basic idea of cryptography is it takes data, scrambles it up with an algorithm to form encrypted data, which is in possible to unscramble without the parameters that were passed into the algorithm. So yeah, that makes it unreadable uh, if it gets intercepted. And then we'll look at hashing, encryption, signing, signatures, uh, commitments, and zero knowledge proof systems. So hashing. <clears throat> a cryptographic hash function is a mathematical algorithm that maps data of an arbitrary size to a bit array of fixed size. It is a one-way function, which means a function for which it is practically practically infeasible to invert or reverse the computation. So you start with an input of any size and you pass it to the hashing function. Some notable fun hashing functions are SHA, MD5, argon 2 and Ketchak256. The number at the end is the size of the uh, bit array at the end. So if we get SHA256, we'll have 256 bits at the end of our hashing algorithm, uh, regardless of what size we pass in. But you get different sizes of SHA. Um, so yeah, you, you get different types of hashing algorithms that yield a different size outputs. And this output is indecipherable. Um, you can't tell what was input from the output. Um, and hashing algorithms will always produce the same output given the same input. Uh, they are fast to compute and they are unique. But because they are fast to compute and they are unique, I mean, because they are uh, always produce the same output and are unique, um, you get something called like a rainbow table uh, where you can look up. So like, let's say I have the password, password123. 
if I make a hash of it using SHA-256, I can see what that um, hash will be. So in my table, if I look up a bit array of 256 length that I know, uh, that I know equals password 123, then I can tell that uh, what was added, or what, what was hashed is the password 123. So hashing alone isn't secured enough for password storage um, or anything that needs to be uh, very secret. So what we do is we add something called salt to a hash. It's a random value that gets added to the password before it's hashed, making it difficult to crack with brute force. Um, and proof of work algorithms for hashing blocks and blockchain add salt through hash uh, when they hash. You also get hash-based message authentication codes. It's a hash that also requires a password at the other end. So only the person that can create the same hash signature must have, um, sorry, so the only person that can create the same hash signature must also have the corresponding password or key. Encryption takes a message, scrambles it up with bytes to make it unreadable, like a ciphertext. Um, yeah, the second example of ciphertext, where substitution ciphertext is uh, more similar to encryption. And then we provide a key that allows someone else to decrypt it and also read the message. The cipher is usually randomized, so each encryption pass yields a different output, even if the key and the message are the same. So then you can't get lookup tables for passwords. This is much more secure than just hashing. You get two types of encryption. The first one is symmetric, where both the sender and the receiver of the message have access to a shared password or key. So I create the encrypted message with a key, and I send the message and the key to the intended recipient, and then they decrypt it with that key. But therefore, you can, if I intercept and I get both the password and the encryption, then I can just put the key in and see the message. So it has some security vulnerabilities. And also, both parties have to agree on one password, which they can't always do. Um, so symmetric encryption isn't the safest. Rather, we use asymmetric encryption, which is a, a public key crypto system. Here, two keys are used. There's a public key that can be shared with anyone. Um, it doesn't matter if anyone sees this public key. But then you get a secret private key, and no one should see that except for the intended recipient. The data gets encrypted with the public key and decrypted with the private key. And um, yeah, in blockchains, we use asymmetric encryption with public and private keys a lot. Digital signatures. The sender of the message, message uses their private key to sign a hash of the original message. This hash, this signed hash um, provides um, the guarantees authenticities. So it says, I'm the one who signed, uh, I'm, I'm the one who sent this message. Um, and that signature gets hashed. The hash guarantees that the message can't be tampered with um, because that would produce an entirely different signature because remember hashes yield a unique output. The recipient or verifier can use the public key to validate the authenticity of the message. And then they can also check the, the signed hash to see that it was indeed their intended um, sender. Commitments. This emulates an uh, envelope, which conceals data. So an example of a commitment that we could use is a DAP for sealed bid auctions. So everyone puts in their bid for something. Um, and then once everyone's commitment is in, uh, we open the envelopes and reveal everyone's bid. And the person with the highest bid would win. There are two algorithms in a commitment scheme. The one is a commit algorithm, which takes in as parameters a message and R where R is a secret random value chosen uniformly from space R. Now in statistics, if we have a, a space R, it means we have a, a set of numbers uh, constituting of R. And if we choose one um, little R ran, uh, uniformly from that space, it means that statistically, I have a equal probability of choosing each element in that set. So it's chosen randomly basically. The commit algorithm that takes in message in R produces something called a commitment string. 
Then you get a verify algorithm that is done at the end. Uh, it takes in as parameters a message, the commitment string, and R. And it produces either an accept or a reject. There are two properties of commitments that for them to be valid, they must be binding and they must be hiding. Hiding means that when it conceals the data, when the envelope is closed before the commitment is opened, you can't open it yet um, and you can't tell if what is inside. And binding means um, that it is bound to the person who made the commitment. Cool. So now we can look at zero knowledge cryptography. A zero knowledge proof or protocol is a way for a prover to convince a verifier that some statement about some secret information is true without revealing the information itself. So I could tell you, I know my password without putting in my password, which is great. Um, if you get hacked, it doesn't matter. You don't have my password. You just know that I know my password. I am who I say I am. So zero knowledge cryptography is really great. It was first mentioned in the 1985 paper, The Knowledge Complexity of Interactive Proof Systems by Shafi Goldwasser and her, um, her colleagues. Um, yeah, it's come a long way since 1985 and it's really popular now because it's really, really useful, um, zero knowledge. Yeah, so um, some examples, basic examples is, suppose I want to prove to a company that I know what my password is without entering my password. So yeah, we've looked at that. Uh, next one, imagine we are playing a game of Where's Wally and suppose I want to prove to you that I know where he is without revealing his location to you because that would ruin your chance of playing the game. I could either cut out um, the picture of just Wally and then say, there we go, I know where he is, but then that also ruins your chance of playing the game because now I've cut him out. Or I can take a huge piece of paper, much bigger than the page that where, Where's Wally is on and cut out a little circle and then move the book randomly um, behind that concealing paper. And then you won't know where on the page he is, but you can see that I do know where he is because I've showed you where he is, that he's somewhere. Um, so that's an example of a uh, zero knowledge proof. That's like the most used example um, to explain what they are. Um, another one is if I have two balls that are slightly different colors and a colorblind friend, how do I prove to them that the balls are different colors without saying which ball is what color? Well, I could take the uh, balls and give them to my friend and say, um, show me the two balls and then put them behind your back and either swap them or don't swap them around and then put them where I can see them again. And then I will tell you whether you swap them around. Um, but there's obviously a 50% chance that I'm right. So I get my friend to do this many, many times. And over time, they will eventually believe me that um, balls are different colors because I can tell if they're swapped or not. And then another example is the Alibaba cave, uh, where one person has a secret key to get inside a cave and the other person uh, doesn't believe that they do have the key. So they take them into the cave to, in, enough times to prove to them they know where the secret key and the secret door is, but they don't reveal where the secret door is um, because that would then that the person could come in. So that would reveal, that would give knowledge. Um, and the point of zero knowledge proofs is we don't say what the statement is. There are three main applications of zero knowledge proofs. Main one is to obscure data, but a great one is to condense data, and then it can also provide data. So in the condensed data example, we can condense computations, very, very dense computa computations into small um, things to compute and store, which is great because um, you can then get really advanced computations on blockchains where it's usually not possible because it would take too much storage and gas. Um, and zero knowledge proofs allow for, because they're so great at condensing data, um, yeah, into small bit arrays and, and, and proofs that we can really do complex stuff um, on a blockchain with through zero knowledge applications. Here's a list of just some of the zero knowledge applications that I could think of. Um, there are so many though. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can look at these. Uh, Security, so it's great for obscuring data, but it's also great for if you think of the password example, where um, I can prove to you I know my password, but then I don't actually have to give you my password. So it doesn't matter if you get hacked. Another one is patient record encryption. So we can perform computations and analyses on 
patient records uh, in in a certain like application of patient record uh, storage, but it's not linked to any one patient. Um, and also we can then store patient records on blockchains, but they're encrypted through zero knowledge proofs. So you can't actually see what the patient data is, which is a really great application that we, 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 we should really use. Because they can condense uh, information so well um, and condense data, zero knowledge applications allow for scalability through rollups, um, where you have a layer one blockchain like Ethereum, and then you get another layer on top of it and you batch transactions and send them to the layer one for proof, um, which increases transaction speed and reduces gas costs. Proof of solvency. So if I have a company, I can prove to maybe the bank that I'm solvent and I have enough money to um, float myself given my expenses without actually showing you exactly how much money I have, because it's not always nice for people to know that. Uh, nuclear disarmament disarmament. Um, so I can, let's say, Russia can prove that they've turned off all their nuclear weapons without saying which ones they've turned off and where. Um, they can create a zero knowledge proof to say they are off, here's the proof, but without saying, oh, look, this one over there is turned off. And then now we know exactly where it is. In computation, especially uh, in a network computation system, it's important to have a reputation. So if one of the computers is malicious, we know not to trust it. But it's also not always nice to be fully public. So if you have a zero knowledge proof, you can create this reputation system, but it's encrypted and you don't know who's who. Uh, you just know whether or not you can trust the, all the computers or not. It's great for voting. You can say that I did vote, but not who I voted for. Identity verification is a great application of zero knowledge. I can prove that I'm a South African citizen without giving you my ID number or my passport number. I can also prove that I'm over 18 without saying my age, stuff like that. Proof of attack malware lab. So I can prove to you that I could attack you um, with like some kind of malware um, without actually having to do the hack and showing you the devastating consequences. I can just show you, oh, look, I found this vulnerability. He has a proof of it, but I'm not going to do it to you. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, CO2 emission verification. I can prove that my CO2 emissions are within a certain threshold and that they are safe. Well, like um, low enough without saying exactly what they are. Great for gaming, especially on blockchains. So. Um, there's this game called the Dark Forest where you move around, move around with different coordinates and your coordinates should be hidden. But obviously everything's public on a blockchain because of universal verifiability. So the game's kind of boring if you know where everyone is. But through zero knowledge, you can prove that you are, you're not cheating and you are playing the game correctly. And you do have coordinates within the game without saying what those coordinates actually are. So now we can have a lot more gaming applications on blockchains. Zero knowledge allows for ring signatures, which in which um, let's say there's seven people, we all can sign a transaction. One of us does sign it and it goes through. It just needs one of seven to sign, but we don't know who signed it. Um, we can also provide private data to smart contracts. So let's say like the patient records uh, through Zoracles. Because we can condense data and computation so much with zero knowledge, we can do really complex things like machine learning on blockchains now. We can also do multi-party computation. So let's say we're working on like something that will go into space and there's a lot of like private data that governments don't want to share, but we all need to work together to make this rocket. I can work on my part, just getting the proof that like the summary and proof of the outputs of other people's analyses and uh, computations. And then I do my work, make a zero knowledge proof of it and send it to them. So we don't see all the data that we don't need, want, that people don't want us to see, but we can still work together and solve problems together. We can have private transactions on public blockchains now. We can do tax payments and prove to the tax man that I did in fact pay the right amount of taxes without saying exactly how much I earn or how much taxes I did pay. And it's great for marketing data. So like social media um, takes all of our data and markets it. And then people will know like, oh, I'm, I like playing guitar or something more personal. But now the big data companies can buy that data through zero knowledge proofs to know X amount of people like playing guitar, but not who those people are. 
So it's great for privacy through marketing data. That's one of my favorite applications of zero-knowledge proofs. Cool, so let's look at privacy and private transactions on public blockchains. So a property of public blockchains is universal verifiability, where only valid transactions are posted to the blockchain. Blockchain uh, Transaction data must be public to the ledger, otherwise how can miners verify it, right? Private transactions are actually possible though on public blockchains if we maintain universal verifiability. This is possible through cryptographic commitments, which we looked at earlier, those envelopes, and zero-knowledge proofs. So universal verifiability is achieved by committing data. The blockchain only stores a commitment to the data, not the actual verified data. And this is uh, using the hiding commitment property, um, so it, it hides and obscures the data within the commitment or inside the envelope. Hiding commitments reveal nothing about the actual state of the blockchain, and they are very, very short strings, a few kilobytes. But if everything is committed, how do we know that it's correct? So we create a proof pi, which is a short zero knowledge proof that is fast to verify, and it proves that the committed transaction data is consistent with the current state, and that the committed new state is correct. Here we get two different types of digital privacy. The first one is pseudonymity. So we have one consistent name, like on Twitter. Uh, you'll have one handle, like mine's to Ringus, and I use that everywhere. And it's great because then I can have a reputation. Um, but a car is this linkable to you. So if I make a tweet that I shouldn't, then all, someone will know all those tweets that I've ever made by, were by me. Um, and then, yeah, I can get in big trouble or my privacy can get uh, publicized. Or you can get true anonymity, which, true anonymity, which is unlinkable, and the system itself can't even tell if two transactions are from the same person. You can still get reputation with this, but it's way more complex to compute, and we won't go into that today. And this is done through cryptographic commitments and zero knowledge proofs. <clears throat> so if we want private transactions on a public blockchain, the most simple way to do this is through mixing. So we'll have a mixing service at address M, and three people with addresses A, B, and C send one ETH each to M. M now has three ETH. Then they all privately send new addresses X, Y, and Z to M, who sends one ETH to each new address. An observer knows what address Y belongs to one of those three people, but not who. Um, obviously, it's one in three that we'll guess right, so it's not very anonymous. So if we mix again and again, then it'll truly become more anonymous. There are problems with this though. The first one is that M knows everything and M can just abscond with three ETH. We have to trust that M is a valid mixer. So mixing with a mix, uh, mixing isn't the best way to um, go about uh, privacy on a blockchain. And you can mix without a mixer. Um, so you don't actually have to trust that address. And uh, in Bitcoin, you can use something like the CoinJoin protocol and Wasabi wallet. On Ethereum, you get trustless mix protocols like Zcoin and the Keeper network. Um, and you also can, there is Tornado Cash, but obviously that's sanctioned um, in many places now. And on Solana, you can use Radium. Sorry, you can also use the Aztec um, protocol, which is a zero knowledge um, blockchain. And all of the Aztec transactions are, are private there. There are negative aspects to privacy though. Uh, you can do criminal activity, just to name a few, you can do tax evasion or ransomware. So what our goal is, is to support positive applications of privacy on blockchains and prevent the negative ones. So how can we ensure legal compliance while preserving privacy? And this is done through zero knowledge proofs. We'll look at uh, the details of zero knowledge proofs soon. So next we have scalability. Um, and mainly rollups. So a zero knowledge rollup chain is an off chain protocol that operates on top of the Ethereum blockchain and is managed by on chain Ethereum smart contracts. Zero knowledge rollups execute transactions outside of mainnet, but periodically commit off chain transaction batches to an on chain rollup contract. This rollup contract is uh, verifies that these are correct uh, transaction batches. And this transaction record is immutable, much like the Ethereum blockchain, and forms the zero knowledge rollup chain. Zero knowledge rollups are hybrid scaling solutions, which are off chain protocols 
that operate independently, but derive security from Ethereum. Specifically, the Ethereum network enforces the validity of state updates on the zero knowledge rollup and guarantees the availability of data behind every update to the rollup state. As a result, zero knowledge rollups are considerably safer than pure off chain scaling solutions such as side chains, which are responsible for the, their own security properties, or Validiums, which also verify transactions on Ethereum with validity proofs, proofs but store the transaction data elsewhere. So zero knowledge rollups are really the best uh, scaling solution in my mind. <clears throat> the zero knowledge core, the zero knowledge rollups core architecture is made up of the following components. There are on-chain contracts. Um, so the zero knowledge protocol is controlled by smart contracts running on Ethereum. This includes the main contract, which stores rollup blocks tracks deposits and monitors state updates. And there's another on-chain contract, the verifier contract, usually written in Solidity, which verifies zero knowledge proofs submitted by block producers. Thus, Ethereum serves the base layer or layer one for the zero knowledge rollup. The zero knowledge rollup also has an off-chain virtual machine. Now a virtual machine is a computer or computing system that emulates another one. So uh, keeping that in mind, um, while the zero knowledge protocol uh, rollup protocol lives on Ethereum, transaction execution and state storage happen on a separate virtual machine independent of the EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine. This off-chain virtual machine is the execution environment for transactions on the zero knowledge rollup and serves as the secondary layer or layer two of the zero knowledge rollup protocol. Validity proofs verified on Ethereum mainnet guarantee the correctness of state transitions in the off-chain VM. So that's in the um, verifier contract that's usually written in Solidity. Zero knowledge rollups rely on the main Ethereum protocol for the following. Firstly, data availability. Zero knowledge rollups publish state data for every transaction processed off chain to Ethereum. With this data, it is possible for individuals or businesses to reproduce the rollup state and validate the chain themselves. Ethereum makes this data available to all participants of the network as call data. Transaction finality. Ethereum acts as the settlement layer for zero knowledge rollups. Layer two transactions are finalized only if the layer one contract accepts the validity proof. This eliminates the risk of malicious operators corrupting the chain and stealing rollup funds, as an example, um, since every transaction must be approved on mainnet. Also, Ethereum guarantees that the user operations cannot be reversed once finalized on layer one. Zero knowledge rollups also re rely on the Ethereum protocol for censorship re resistance. So most zero knowledge uh, rollups use a super node, which is the operator to execute transactions, produce batches and submit blocks to layer one. While this ensures efficiency, it increases the risk of censorship, malicious so, malicious zero knowledge rollup operators can censor users by refusing to include their transactions in batches. As a security message, measure, zero knowledge rollups allow users to submit transactions directly to the rollup contract on mainnet if they think they are being censored by the operator. This allows users to force an exit from the zero knowledge rollup to Ethereum without having to rely on the operator's permission. So, how do zero knowledge rollups work? Let's look at how the transactions work. Users in the zero knowledge rollup sign transactions and submit to the layer two operators for processing and inclusion in the next batch. In some cases, the operator is a centralized entity called a sequencer who executes transactions, aggregates them into batches and submits to layer one. The sequencer in the system is the only entity allowed to produce layer two blocks and add rollup transactions to the zero knowledge rollup contract. Other zero knowledge rollups may rotate the operator role by using a proof of stake validator set. This is obviously much better. Prospective operators deposit funds in the, into the rollup contract with the size of each stake influencing the staker's chance of getting selected to produce the next rollup batch. The operator's stake can be slashed if they act maliciously, which incentivizes them to post valid blocks. Transaction data publication in a zero knowledge rollup is done through call data. This is the data area in a smart contract used to pass arguments to a function and behave similarly to memory. While call data isn't stored as part of the Ethereum state, 
It persists on chain as part of the Ethereum chain's history logs. Zero knowledge rollups use call data to publish compressed transaction data on chain. On chain. The rollup operator simply adds the new batch by calling the required function in the rollup contract and passes the compressed data as, a function as function arguments, which helps reduce gas costs. And um, yeah, <laughs> it reduces gas costs um, because um, there's yeah, less storage. State commitments. The zero knowledge rollup state, which includes layer two accounts and balances, is represented as a Merkle tree. A cryptographic hash of the Merkle tree's root is stored in the on-chain contract, allowing the rollup protocol to track changes in the state of the zero knowledge rollup. The rollup transitions to a new state after the execution of a new set of transactions. The operator who initiated the state transition is required to compute a new state root and submit to the on-chain contract. If the validity proof associated with the batch is authenticated by the verifier contract, the new Merkle root becomes the zero knowledge rollups canonical state root. Validity proofs allow parties to prove the correctness of a statement without revealing the statement itself. They are therefore zero knowledge proofs. Zero knowledge rollups use validity proofs to confirm the correctness of off chain state transitions without having to re execute the transactions on Ethereum. And that's part of why they're so fast. These proofs can come in the form of a ZK snark or a ZK stock. A ZK snark is a zero knowledge succinct non interactive argument of knowledge, and a ZK stock is a zero knowledge scalable transparent argument of knowledge. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. We'll look at it next. So now let's look at ZK EVMs. So EVM stands for Ethereum Virtual Machine. Zero knowledge Ethereum Virtual Machines use ZK snark technology to make cryptographic proofs of execution of Ethereum-like transactions, either to make it much easier to verify the Ethereum chain itself, or to build zero-knowledge rollups that are close to equivalent to what Ethereum provides, but are much more scalable. But there are subtle differences between these projects and trade-offs between them, uh, yeah, between practicality and speed. So there are four types of ZK EVMs. The first one is fully Ethereum equivalent. Then we get fully EVM equivalent almost EVM equivalent, and high-level language equivalent. Fully Ethereum equivalent, um, these type of ZK EVMs do not change any part of the Ethereum system to make it easier to generate proofs. They do not replace hashes, state trees, transaction trees, pre-compiles, or any other in-consensus logic, no matter how peripheral. These ZK EVMs are what we ultimately need to make the Ethereum layer 1 itself more scalable. But Ethereum was not originally designed around ZK friendliness, so there are many parts of the Ethereum protocol that take a large amount of computation to prove through zero knowledge. However, this, the privacy and scaling explorations team is working to create this type of ZK EVM. And if this is successful, layer one will become scalable. The next is the most common uh, in the zero knowledge rollups we know. Um, and the, these rollups use a uh, type of fully EVM equivalent zero knowledge um, EVM. However, we don't have this yet. This is the goal. So these EVMs strive to be exactly EVM equivalent, but not quite Ethereum itself equivalent. That is, they look exactly like Ethereum from within, but they have some differences on the outside, particularly, particularly in data structures, like the block structure and state tree. The goal is to be fully compatible with existing applications, but make some minor modifications to Ethereum to make development easier and to make proof of generation proof generation faster. These ZK EVMs make changes to data structures that hold things like the Ethereum state. Fortunately, these are structures that the EVM itself cannot access directly, and so applications that work on Ethereum would almost always work on these EVMs. There's a disadvantage. Um, while they provide faster computation times, uh, if you had a fully Ethereum, com um, uh, Ethereum compatible um, EVM, then that would be faster. Um, and there's also, um, because we remove parts of the Ethereum stack that rely on needlessly complicated and ZK and friendly cryptography, then there's slowness to prove the Ethereum, uh, yeah, there's slowness basically. So it's, it, it's a, a big improvement from um, just a, a layer one, but um, it's, it's still a bit slower. So two notable examples of this is Scrolls EV, ZK EVM and Polygon Hermes. 
They are both working towards becoming this type of fully EVM equivalent ZK EVM, but currently what they are is a partially equivalent ZK EVM. These ZK EVMs are almost EVM um, equivalent, but they make a few sacrifices to exact equivalence to further improve prover times and make the EVM easier to develop. They might remove a few features that are ex exceptionally hard to implement in a ZK EVM implementation. Precompiles are often at the top of the list here. Additionally, these ZK EVMs sometimes also have minor differences in how they treat contract code, memory, and stack. So there will be some applications that would need to be rewritten, either because they use precompiles that these types of ZK EVMs remove, or because of subtle dependencies on edge cases, edge cases, edge cases <laughs> that the VMs treat differently. So yeah, most of the ZK EVMs in the rollups we know are partially EVM equivalent right now, working towards becoming fully EVM equivalent. You also get high level language equivalent. These work by taking smart contract source code written in a high level language like Solidity or Viper and compiling that to some language that is explicitly designed to be ZK snark friendly. There's a lot of overhead that you can avoid by not ZK, ZK proving all the different parts of this EVM execution step and starting from a higher level code directly. Compiling from high level languages directly can greatly reduce costs and help decentralization by making it easier to be a prover. However, the ZK EVM address will differ from the Ethereum address, and there will be lots of debugging infrastructure that cannot be carried over because of the infrastructure runs over the, because that uh, infrastructure from Ethereum runs over the EVM bytecode, and now we're not doing that. Um, and a notable example is ZK Sync. So let's look at some protocols, tools, and tech. Um, so if you're looking into developing zero knowledge uh, applications and uh, proofs, the there are some languages that are really helpful. Um, I really like Circom. Um, it's, uh, it helps, it's a language that helps write um, arithmetic circuits. And um, you write a Circom circuit to prove something, and then you verify it in Solidity. Or I suppose you could do Viper too, but I've just only done it in Solidity. Cairo, uh, Starknet uses uh, the language Cairo. It's quite similar to Solidity, but a bit lower level. And it's um, a great uh, a great thing because you can write uh, your proof and your circuit and your verification in one language. Um, yeah, Solidity, like I said, if you want to uh, verify a proof in Circom, you can uh, a circuit in Circom, you can use Solidity. Polygon developed zk ASM, which uh, Polygon Hermes is being written in, and it's zero knowledge assembly, which is great. Socrates is a bit similar to Circom, but uh, a bit more, um, it's not just focused on arithmetic circuits, it's, it's language in its own right, which is a really great language for learning, uh, for making zero knowledge proofs. Then you get uh, frameworks, you get many frameworks, so you get Snarks, JS, ZK Snark, Rust. Um, so these are just like libraries and frameworks that you can use in any language you like. Uh, there's one for Java, surprisingly. And um, there's also something called Snarky, which um, Mina protocol, uh, actually Snarky is a language and Mina protocol uses that. Then there's a tool called Warp. It was developed by Nethermind. And this, in this, you can write your whole zero knowledge proof in Solidity and then um, Warp transpiles it down into, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, into a zero knowledge proof for you. Uh, into like Circom, I think, or oh, Circom equivalent. It'll create an arithmetic circuit for you. So if you're starting with zero knowledge and you're a Solidity developer and you don't know where to start, I would start by just transpiling stuff in Warp. There are many blockchains that use zero knowledge. Um, here's just a few. Uh, we get Ethereum, with, this is obviously the layer one for all these rollups, Polygon Hermes, Polygon's Midden, Starknet and Starkware, ZK Sync, Scroll, Scroll's really great. The MENA protocol is um, its own blockchain. It's tiny, it's 256 kilobytes, and um, it uses zero knowledge proof and it's proofs and it's written in, in Snarky JS. It's really a cool uh, application of zero knowledge. And if you haven't checked it out, it's really worth checking out. And Aztec is also a great zero knowledge blockchain. Cool, let's look into zero knowledge proofs. So there are three properties of a zero knowledge proof. They must be complete, 
which means all in valid inputs return true. There must be sound, which means all invalid inputs return false. And there must have zero knowledge, which means the party requesting verification learns nothing about the statements that they didn't already know. You get two types of zero, uh, zero knowledge proofs, interactive ones and non-interactive ones. In the interactive type of zero knowledge proof, the prover and the verifier interact several times. The verifier challenges the prover who provides replies to challenges until the verifier is convinced. You can use this if there's a single verifier, like a compliance auditor, but if you have more and you need to do a back and forth between them, it's going to take too long. So we tend to favor non-interactive zero knowledge proofs. Here, the interaction between a prover and a verifier can be simulated by the prover, making direct communication between the verifier unnecessary and making, sorry, direct communication to the verifier unnecessary and making proof generation possible to do offline. Subsequently, such a proof can be sent and verified by almost also verifying that the simulation of the verifier was done correctly. This is great when you have many verifiers, and an example is miners on a roll-up blockchain. Cool, so some zero-knowledge proofs have what we call a setup. The setup phase is where the prover creates a public and corresponding private key. The prover sends the private key to the verifier who uses it to generate challenges. The way a prover and a verifier know that they're, the, they're with the same statement is by using a common reference string and uh, the trusted setup is a process to generate this common reference string. A common reference string is combined with the structured reference string, which is encrypted so that it can be reused. You get two types of proof setups, trusted setups. Um, so this is a ceremony that is uh, done once to generate a piece of data that must then be used every time some cryptographic protocol is run. So if I want to prove to you that, let's say there's many patient records, and I want to prove to you each patient record is is validly uh, uh, proven. Each time I need to do a new trusted setup using new data. And at the end of that, we must destroy this data. It has to be secret, this data, otherwise the whole thing gets ruined. So we tend to favor what is called a universal setup. A universal protocol is one that does not require a separate trusted setup for each circuit. You do it once and then you're good to go for hundreds of zero knowledge proofs. Um, so yeah, as we said, the setup phase is where the prover creates a public and corresponding private key. Um, and when we do this with a trusted setup, um, yeah, um, okay, I've explained this. <laughs> um, so yeah, trusted setups are needed for algorithms such as Groth16 and Plonk zero knowledge proof systems. These are two very, very popular um, zero knowledge proof systems. And uh, an example of a trusted serum setup ceremony is the powers of tau, and they have a cost, constant time verification of setup. You also get transparent proofs. A zero knowledge proof is transparent if it requires no trusted setup. This greatly reduces the computation time for creating the witness and thus the proof. They instead rely on verifiable randomness for the ceremony, the setup ceremony. So when we said stocks, those were transparent proofs. So now we know that stocks don't have a trusted setup. There are three parts of a zero knowledge proof, the, the statement, the witness, and their relation. So if I want to say an example of a zero knowledge proof is I know a secret message such that the hash of the secret equals some hash value, let's say zero. Then here, the statement in this example is the public data describing what is being proven, the hash value. The witness, W, is the private data that supports our statement. It's the secret, that message that gets passed into the hash. The relation R is between uh, the witness and statement X, and the relation is that X equals the hash of W. A statement pi is true if there is a witness such that the relationship between W and X is true. And equally, the statement is false if there's no such witness. We grade zero knowledge proofs on these four criteria, the prover time, the proof size, we want that as small as possible, the verification time, and the time to create the common and standard reference strings. So I was talking about circom and arithmetic circuits. So let's see what those are. Let's say um, we have something called a finite field, which is a set of integers. So we're going to fix a finite field f zero to p minus one for some prime p greater than two where all arithmetic all arithmetic is done modulo p 
So all this means is we have a field of integers, which is a set, and they go in order. And um, we're going to use prime numbers up to p um, minus 1 of p greater than 2. And now an arithmetic circuit is we, we fix this finite field in f. Um, and yeah, what an arithmetic circuit is, circuit is, is it's a directed acyclic graph. What that means is it's, um, it has different nodes and it shows you how to move between the nodes and it doesn't go backwards on itself. That's the acyclic part. So the internal nodes are labeled plus, minus, and times, and inputs are labeled 1, x1, to xn. This evaluates an n-variant polynomial with an evaluation recipe. And we said the size of an arithmetic circuit is um, the number of gates in C. And we'll see what gates are now. So if this was confusing, uh, let's look at an example. So let's say I'm trying to prove a plus b times b plus times c. So b, c into a plus b. My inputs are a, b, and c. Then we have three gates, which are our internal nodes. So we have the inputs and the nodes, and then we create this directed acyclic graph. So A goes into the plus sign, and so does B, so we know that it's A plus B. Then they go into the times, so we know that that gets times, and then B goes into the times, so does C, so we know they get times, and they get times by gate one, which is A and B added together. Then you get something called an argument system. These are usually for NP problems, which are polynomial time problems to compute. We have two parties again, a prover and a verifier. So we're going to fix an arithmetic circuit C, which takes in two inputs. A public statement, which is in, which is in a list of N elements in field F. So we're going to take one of those elements and make a list, or like a list of those elements. And then we're going to take a secret witness in FM, which is a list of M elements in field F. The prover is given statement X and witness W. Verifier is only given statement X. P's goal is to convince V by message passing that there exists a witness such that the circuit taking in X and W equals zero. Argument systems like zero knowledge proofs can be interactive or non-interactive. So we can either pre-process this argument system or we can just calculate it as is, but um, pre-processing makes it uh, faster. Um, if V accepts proof pi, then it must be that P actually knows the witness W. Um, a argument system is complete if W equals a correct witness. So if we accept, it must then fo follow that a, um, there was an honest prover. So an honest prover will always convince the honest verifier to accept pi. You can get argument systems that have additional properties, and this is the, the argument system of knowledge, which just accept means that if V accepts, it means that P actually knows the witness. If P, the proof pi reveals nothing about the witness to V, then it is a zero knowledge argument system. You can also get a succinct argument system, which goes in logarithmic time for, uh, for a proof pi of size n, V can verify in time log n. So now we know what a ZK snark is because we just learned all these words. So it's a zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. And here's the construction flow for ZK snark. We make our computations. So we want to prove like, I don't know, the hash of something is zero. Then we create an arithmetic circuit for it. Then we do uh, constraint systems and a quadratic arithmetic program. We won't look at those today. And then we create the snark. SNARKs have a very short proof time and very short proofs, and they verify in little time. It is a tuple, S, P, and V. Uh, S, C is the public parameters S, P, and V for P and V. We'll explain that now. And then P, so P takes in S, P, X, and W and produces a short proof pi of size O log, well, log size of the circuit, which is the number of gates in the circuit. V takes in statement V, X, and proof pi and either accepts or rejects in log x. It has to be done so fast, this log x, the verification, that 
we don't actually have time to read the circuit, and that's done through the pre-processing. To help V verify such large circuits, we summarize the circuit and create the parameters SP and SV, where SV is a short summary of the circuit being verified. Um, if SPV is succinct and V learns nothing about W, the witness from Pi, the proof, then it is a zero knowledge stock. Zero knowledge stocks are zero knowledge scalable transparent arguments of knowledge, so there's no trusted setup. They prove the validity of off-chain computations without revealing the inputs. However, ZK stocks are considered an improvement on SNARKs because of their scalability and their transparency. With ZK SNARKs, proving and verification time scales linearly in relation to the size of the underlying computation. But with ZK stocks, they require less time than SNARKs for proving and verifying the large data sets involved, making them useful for high volume applications. So a lot of things um, that uh, really efficient blockchains are use stocks instead of snarks like Starkware and Starknet. Um, an important thing to note about ZK stocks versus ZK snarks is that ZK stocks have no quantum risk. This means that with the advent of quantum computing, we can actually brute force crack ZK snark computation or proofs. And um, with ZK stocks, you can't do that. It doesn't matter how advanced quantum computers get, you can't crack and uh, falsify a stock. So ultimately, stocks are, have quite a few um, advantages over st snarks. These are, this is just a, a table I took from Wikipedia, uh, and um, it's some of the zero knowledge proof systems that are available. It's not all of them, like Dark isn't here, and there's a few uh, missing. But what I find quite interesting, just look at on the right, is the programming paradigm. So you can either do procedural assembly, like the um, Polygon and ZKSM, or arithmetic circuits like CIRCOM. Most is done through arithmetic circuits, or you can do object oriented like Silch, which is a type of ZK stock. Um, and yeah, we know um, if they're transparent, they don't have a trusted setup. If they're universal, um, the, the, you do the setup ceremony once, and then you don't have to redo it for each. Um, following a computation or proof. And if they are post-quantum secure, then you can't crack them with brute force. And you'll see all the snark ones and bulletproofs are not quantum post-quantum secure, whereas all the stark ones are. Um, otherwise, uh, but there is a, uh, an exception, which is the CK snark Virgo that is post-quantum secure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was Tamara Ringus, and this was another episode of Solidity Fridays brought to you by Linum Labs.